Jonathan Kemboi Toroitich Moy, that is the eldest son of retired President Daniel Arap Moy, has died. He died in Nakuru a few hours ago. He was 62 years old. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but the story of a firstborn is the story of a family, especially a firstborn son. Yeah, because uh, Jonathan had an older sister. Yeah, he was actually the second born. Now, the period of the death of a person is normally a very sensitive time in any family. And my deep and sincere condolences go to the Moy family. However, I beg for your apologies in advance because I'm not one of those people who believe in creating stories, creating fiction about a man's life or a woman's life after they've passed on. In Africa, it is common to glorify the dead, to praise them. In Africa, one of the backward things about us is that we don't say the truth about the dead. We don't speak evil. We don't speak bad things about the dead. My late political lecturer was an exceptional man. But at his funeral, I spoke the truth. Apart from his achievements and apart from the good things, I also touched on other things. And uh, this seems to have rubbed uh, some people up the wrong way. Because one of his friends felt it necessary when he had a chance to speak. To make excuses for the dead man yeah, concerning some things I'd said, which were 100% true. My humble advice, yes, a close person to you has died. But speak the truth. Say something that will stand the test of time. Jonathan Kip Kemboi was born in 1957. Yeah, that was just one year before the first African elected African leaders entered parliament, yeah, which was called the LECO, Legislative Council in those days. A year before his father, Daniel Moy, was elected to that LECO to represent the Rift Valley. Jonathan was born to Daniel Moy and his wife, Lena Moy. And this baby grew up to be the rebellious firstborn son who gave his father <laughs> a lot of sleepless nights. And this seems to have informed his father's decisions here on the other sons who came later. Whenever they displayed some indiscipline, yeah. For instance, Philip Moy was sent off to the military very early, immediately after he finished secondary school, so that he could get some uh, discipline and direction in his life. And in the end, the only son Moy would work with was his youngest son, Gideon Moy, the current senator of Baringo. And it is this youngest son who has ended up being the de facto firstborn yeah, instead of Jonathan. Now, there was a major event in the Moy family yeah, which worsened Jonathan Kipkemboy's rebellious streak. And this was the decision by Moy, yeah, Daniel Moy, to remove his wife Lena completely from his side yeah, and from public limelight. And for all intents and purposes, to part with her. Yeah, some would say, abandon her. Now, in a previous video on this channel, I've covered the circumstances surrounding that rather extensively. But very briefly, Lena Moy is the only woman, the late Lena Moy, is the only woman in Kenyan history who has the distinction of being asked for a dance by the President of the Republic of Kenya and saying, no! <laughs> this drama unfolded at Nakuru State House. Yeah, and actually the first President of Kenya was trying to defuse a very volatile and embarrassing situation. You see what had happened is that rumors, whether true or not, had reached Lena that her husband, Daniel Moy, had a thing yeah, with a certain police officer belonging to the House of Mumbi. And at the said public function yeah, to usher in the new year, 
you know, the traditional uh, dance in state house involving the president, yeah, the vice president and cabinet ministers to usher in the new year that used to be a tradition in those days. At that dinner dance, Lena saw Moy with that other woman. Yeah, I believe her name was Lillian. Over the years, I've not been able to verify whether they were just talking or dancing. Yeah, but Lena Moy went ballistic. And Jomo Kenyatta tried to defuse the situation by asking Lena for a dance. And Lena said, no. Yeah. Now, there are sources who say that under great duress, she finally danced with the first president of Kenya. But that did not diffuse yeah, this drama, which greatly embarrassed Daniel Rapmoy. More so at a time when he was being embarrassed all the time by the Kiambu Mafia, those close to Jomo, who derided him, teased him, and uh, just did everything to make his life very uncomfortable. Actually unbearable, yeah, because there's evidence to suggest that Moy tried to step down, to resign from the vice presidency, at least on one occasion. Anyway, those are stories for another day. <laughs> yeah. The bottom line here is that this seems to have been the last straw. Yeah. Moy banished his wife Lena to his farm in Eldama Ravine, where she resided until her death in 2004. Two years after husband had left power. But uh, the topic of today is Jonathan. Jonathan sided with his mother. And when he was old enough, he went to live with his mother. It is very instructive that in 2002, when Jonathan decided to vie for the Eldama Ravine parliamentary seat, in talking to the press about what he'd do, yeah, he started with family values and talked at length about the plight of abandoned women and divorced women, which he would address if elected as a member of parliament for Eldama Ravine. And remember the time that he was talking to the press about this, his father was still in power. Actually, it was at the tail end of his presidency. This was 2002, yeah, in the run-up to those elections, which his father was not going to buy for re-election. Now, there was no other way this could be interpreted by those who knew the family well, <laughs> except as a direct job, a direct bab at his father and his relationship with his mother, Lena. And of course, at this time, Lena Moy was still alive. Yeah, and in fact, the farm where she lived in was in this particular constituency yeah, that uh, Jonathan wanted to win. And for the record, he didn't win. Yeah, and he vied again for this parliamentary seat, yeah, and was also unsuccessful again. Now, in 2002, when Jonathan was unsuccessful in winning the Eldama Ravine parliamentary seat, in sharp contrast, his last born brother, Gideon, was elected to take over his father's constituency, Yabaringo Central. And just like his father, Gideon Moy entered politics unopposed. Decades earlier, Gideon's father, Moy, had been elected into office in the Rift Valley, unopposed. But early on, he had taken over yeah, as the appointed representative of the Rift Valley for the colonialists from a man called Dr. John Ole Tameno. And very interesting, the good doctor was dropped in favor of Moy because he was accused of very heavy drinking. And throughout his life, Moy kept well away from any hard drinks. Yeah, he was a teetotaler. And looked down on heavy drinkers. And so guess what? Jonathan became a very heavy drinker. Yeah, and to make matters worse, he drank in public as if to spite his father. Anyway, circumstances in 2002, when Gideon first got elected, were very different from what they were in 1958 or in the 1950s when his father first entered politics. But still, history was repeated. Gideon got elected completely unopposed on a canoe ticket. And Gideon's election was critical, yeah, critical 
to the Daniel Toretich Arapmoy exit plan and strategy, exit from power. I have mentioned in earlier videos on this channel how elaborate that Moy exit strategy was, extremely elaborate. And Gideon Moy, the last born son, was bang in the middle of it. While his other son, yeah, his first born son, and his uh, rightful heir, for all intents and purposes, Jonathan Kipkemboy, was vying for a seat in Eldama Ravine, yeah, where his mother lived, in complete rebellion still to his father, and completely out of his father's plans. Jonathan Kipkemboy will be best remembered as a very successful rally driver. And it is very ironic yeah, that uh, Jonathan has ended up passing on during the Easter holidays. You see, in the old days, the Easter holidays in Kenya were synonymous with a very famous later international safari rally. Under the name Jonathan Toroitich, rather than Jonathan Moy, Jonathan competed in a lot of these safari rallies. Yeah, the event was annual. And not only gave a good account of himself, but became very famous in Kenya and beyond as a rally driver. I guess his reckless, rebellious behavior, yeah, found expression driving at crazily high speeds, yeah, through the rough and muddy roads of Kenya. He also ended up winning quite a handful of local rallies. And yet again, his father was very strongly opposed yeah, to his getting involved in rallying. <laughs> so what did he do? He went ahead anyway yeah, and ended up making a name for himself. In an event, yeah, his father was strongly against him participating in. But it is Jonathan's involvement in rallying that brings us to perhaps his most controversial face yeah, in life. Now, Jonathan's co-driver in rallying was a man called Ibrahim Choge, the son of a Rift Valley politician called Kiptum Choge. Now, Jonathan was very close to a younger sister of his called Doris Elizabeth Chepkorir. Doris was a twin sister to Philip Moy, yeah, whom we have talked about. Yeah, his father took him very quickly to join the army. And Doris, against the wishes of uh, her father, her father was very strongly opposed, ended up marrying yeah, Jonathan's co-driver, uh, Bonachoge, Ibrahim Choge. Now, Ibrahim Choge was really a farmhand yeah, at uh, Jonathan's farm. Yeah, some called him the farm manager. But over the years, he struck up a very close friendship with Jonathan. And there's no doubt that Jonathan was a great influence yeah, in, uh, in this marriage that ended up happening between his own sister, Doris, and uh, his farm manager, Ibrahim Choge. A wedding that made his father just live it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Jonathan thrived in doing things that made his father live it, angry. But sadly... Ibrahim Choge ended up dead, murdered, shortly after falling out very badly with Jonathan. And for clarity purposes, let us start that story of Jonathan falling out with his friend of many years, Ibrahim Choge, right at the beginning. In September 1988, a British tourist called Julie Ward disappeared, vanished, at the world famous Masai Mara. Now tourism is a major foreign exchange honor for Kenya. Yeah, still is. And those days even more so. And so you'd have imagined that the Kenyan government would have just gone basak trying to solve this mystery. <laughs> but the very opposite happened. It seemed as if the Kenyan government was very reluctant yeah, to even lift a finger, even into finding the body, yeah, if she was dead, because it was assumed she was dead. You know, when people disappear, <laughs> the most likely outcome is that they end up dead. 
So the Kenyan government was very, very reluctant. Yeah, and uh, it seemed as if they were not even interested. Fortunately, Julie's father yeah, was a man of means. Yeah, he's a, he was a wealthy hotelier in Britain. And so he flew to Kenya, used his own personal finances in a very elaborate search at the Masai Mara for his daughter. And finally her abandoned car was found and the remains of her body yeah, cut up to pieces were also found. What followed was a very determined effort by the Kenyan government yeah, to falsify the evidence yeah, so that it looks like Julie Ward was actually killed, mauled by wild animals. Although the evidence was very clear, she was murdered. And the plot thickened yeah, when eyewitnesses came out yeah, and reported that actually Jonathan Moy was cited with the late Julie Ward yeah, at a very popular restaurant in Nairobi shortly before her death. But the investigation dragged on for years. Yeah, a game ranger was even charged for the murder, later acquitted, and the mystery remains. Now the height of the fallout between Jonathan Moy yeah, and Ibrahim Choge, multiple eyewitnesses overheard yeah, a quarrel between the two. And in that quarrel, Ibrahim Choge uttered the shell-shocking words as follows. One day, he was talking to Jonathan, one day I will blacken your name around the world for what you did to that girl in the Mara. yeah. Now, a police source who was sent by the CID in those days, Criminal Investigation Department, into the Mara to investigate this murder, yeah, and who ended up falsifying his report under orders, later met yeah, with Julie Ward's dad, and the policeman is said to have told Julie Ward's father that his daughter was actually murdered by the bodyguards of Jonathan Moy. And the motive could have been the rape, yeah, which uh, is said to have happened shortly before her death. Now, after the fallout yeah, between Jonathan and uh, Ibrahim Choge, Ibrahim continued rallying on his own yeah, without being a co-driver to Jonathan. And then in June 9th, 1998, yeah, almost 10 years after the murder of Julie Ward, Ibrahim Choge died in a mysterious road accident where all the evidence pointed to murder. A woman who witnessed the accident says that he swerved at the last minute to avoid a log that had been put on the road. Yeah, this is the Kisumo Kapsabet Road. And she says she saw Ibrahim coming out of the wreckage, yeah, you know, the overturned car, you know, crawling out. And she started to go and help him. And then she noticed three people who had been hiding in the thicket, emerging. And she ran away. Later, Ibrahim Choge was found in the wreckage. Yeah. And it was assumed that he had died as a result of injuries uh, he got from the accident. However, evidence that emerged later showed yeah, marks on his wrists, indicating that at one time he had been tied up. Together with quite a number of other pieces of evidence, it was clear that Ibrahim Choge was murdered. Later, his dad, Kiptum Choge, was quoted as telling sources close to Julie Ward's father that, and I quote, they murdered him. Now they're trying to kill me. Kiptum Choge died in 2013 and he went to his grave adamant that his son had been murdered and he appeared to know exactly who murdered his son and he went to the grave with that secret. Now, the name Jonathan Moy again burst into the limelight in January this year when in a hotel in Kitale yeah, a young man called Collins 
Toroitich, who is actually the son of Jonathan, yeah, was involved in a very controversial incident where he left abandoned his girlfriend at the hotel, yeah, and escaped, yeah, with a bill owing that hotel a bill of over a hundred thousand Kenya shillings. That is over a thousand US dollars. His girlfriend's name is Masha Amario, yeah, the daughter of a very famous, rich Naivasha family. And Masha later came out and made some very explosive revelations. She said that she was epileptic, yeah, and that she met Collins at Karen Hospital in 2017. And she was undergoing counseling, mental counseling, while Collins was undergoing counseling concerning his alcoholism. And the two struck up a friendship, yeah, which grew into an affair. And later on, Collins moved into her apartment in Lovington. And they started living together. But then later they parted ways, and Marsha accused Collins of being violent against her. But early this year, in Kitale, at the Skynest Hotel, the two had a reunion. Yeah, this was to mark her 30th birthday. And she said Collins had promised to pay for everything. But then they accumulated this bill. And when the hotel could no longer give them any more services, Collins slipped away yeah, and escaped. And when he was called later, he said he was in Kabarak making arrangements to get the money to clear the bill. And this immediately appeased the hotel, yeah, because I'm sure they assumed that he was with his grandfather, yeah, retired President Daniel Arap Moy, yeah, trying to get the money. But later, he switched off his phone a few days later. And so the hotel called in the police, and Marsha was arrested and put behind bars. I think she spent a night in police cells. But she was bailed out by the Moy family when they heard about the embarrassing incident yeah, and cleared the bill. And this is not the first time that Collins was in trouble. In July 27, 2016, he appeared in a Nakuru court charged with stealing two mobile phones from two ladies. Again, the issue was settled out of court with the Moy family money. Sadly, it seems, even with the demise of Jonathan Kipkimboy, that family name will most probably be kept in the limelight, courtesy of Collins. Fare thee well, Jonathan Kipkemboy. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekuja.